and audacity in three, two, one. Hi guys, and welcome back to another episode of the Barbell Lifestyle Podcast. I'm your host, Christina Lynn, and I'm here with my co-host, Marissa Roy. And in today's episode, we're going to be discussing, is it too late to start? Yeah, and before we do, I think it's funny because the past like three, four episodes have been like life updates, life updates, everything is happening. (laughs) And then we, before this, we were like, do we have anything to talk about? We're like, hmm. Nah, nope, not that I can think of. <laughs> no pregnancies, no uh, engagements. <laughs> pretty, pretty normal week. Yeah, everything's been a lot more, a lot more calm. Uh, we did get to, I guess, one thing I I didn't mention. It's not like news, but we uh, got to meet up last this past weekend. Aaron and I's family, so my mom's side and his parents got to meet for the first time. So that was cool. Wow, how yeah. was that? Um, actually a lot of fun a lot (laughs) like didn't know what to expect but like everyone like gelled really well and it was just a good time yeah and correct me if I'm wrong but I feel like Aaron's parents and your parents are like completely different yeah it's just like I didn't envision it as like them like immediately hitting it off like for whatever reason but like yeah like I don't know. I just didn't, I didn't know what to expect, but like, I think the, I think what really what I forgot to factor in was the fact that like both of our parents love us a lot and like that will bond anyone more than, you know, any small differences or, you know, mannerisms or, you know, culture or anything like that. Yeah, absolutely. I always think it's so funny because my parents and my husband's parents are so drastically different. So sometimes we'll be having a conversation like my brother-in-law was just here two weeks ago and we were having a conversation at dinner or we were watching like a stand-up and I was like, could you imagine having this conversation at your dinner table? And he's like, (laughs) no, absolutely not. So it's just so funny, just like how different how different they are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Totally. But yeah, they, they always get along. Um, and it, I was just telling Marissa before we started recording that my husband's parents just booked their first trip to come see us in five years since we've been out here. So we're super excited. They'll be here in November. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. We're super excited. Cool. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's all we have going on. <laughs> yeah. And Thankfully. I started, started planning our nursery. So I'm going to be 20 weeks pregnant on Thursday. And I feel like I've got a late start, <laughs> but it just took me so long to decide on things. And I think, especially as a first time mom, I have no idea what to expect and I don't know what I need. So all of the things are very overwhelming, like trying to create a baby registry. I'm like, I don't know how many onesies and (laughs) these things and like what I'm going to need. So I'm trying to go off of everything I see on social media and kind of take my best guess. (laughs) So any, uh, any moms out there who want to DM me and give me some tips, that would be very helpful, but hopefully I'll get some furniture for the nursery here soon. That's one of the things I'm definitely nervous about for shipping and all of those fun post COVID, pre-COVID, intra-COVID. I don't know (laughs) (laughs) whatever season that we're in right now with like shipping and supplies and all that. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And I feel like a part of it will just be like, you know, you set it up the best you can, you do all your research and then like the baby will come and then you'll be like, oh, we totally need more of this. Or like we, we completely missed this. And then like, you kind of just learn by, by doing, I feel like at a certain point. (laughs) And the best advice I feel like I've been given from all of my mom friends, <laughs> which is so weird to say that I'm going to be like one of those people. Now. Um, <laughs> but like every baby is different. So even if something worked for a previous one, doesn't mean it's going to work for you. So just trying to figure out what your baby likes and doesn't like, but that'll be fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was listening to um, one of the 3DMJ podcasts with Nick Licamelli, who we just had on last episode. Um, and he, like, as we know, is recently a dad and it was something he made some pretty terrible joke on the episode (laughs) and he goes sorry guys like ever since I became a dad the dad jokes just got worse (laughs) yeah Um, you made me think of that when you're like I'm gonna be a mom (laughs) so something I just thought about actually from this past weekend was the Olympia and I feel like that's a really good segue to kind of jump into what we wanted to talk about today but 
Jenron Zidi, if you're not familiar with the sport of bodybuilding, um, I love her. I think she's such a great athlete in the sport. So she competes in the bikini division and I started following her and I don't know, uh, Marissa, if you know, but she's from Maryland. Oh, cool. Yeah. So, you know, we, well, I used to be in the, um, DMV area. And so I followed Jen Ronzini. She started competing at age 30, which is super cool that that's actually when she first got into bodybuilding. So she was like, heck I'm 30. <laughs> like, what do I do? And so she started getting into bodybuilding or I'm sorry, lifting. And then that led to getting into bodybuilding. And I think she, I'm going to have to go back and read what exactly her stats are. I'll see if I can pull them up real quickly, but I think she got her pro card at 33 and uh, I have it right here. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. Okay. She, oh, she hit her very first Olympia at 33. So she started competing at 30. 33 first Olympia placed fifth. She was crowned the runner up at 34. And now at 39, she is still one of the top seven competitors in the world. That's insane. Right. And then Erin Stern, she's, I believe 41. So she was a two time figure Olympia winner and she switched over. I don't know how many years later she, I, she, I mean, the figure division has just evolved tremendously and she I don't know if downsize is the right word, but she now competes in the bikini division and she was top, top 10, top 15, I think. And she's 41. So it was just super, super cool to see some of the athletes. And uh, I think there was another master's competitor as well, who did pretty well, but, um, I think the top 15, there were nine new competitors who placed at the Mr. Olympia. And I think that's insane. So that means that they were completely different from the top 15 last Olympia. Yeah. Yeah. That's insane. That's amazing. Yeah. So, you know, the thing that we wanted to talk about today is, am I like, is it too late to start? Is it too late to start into your fitness journey, whether that's health, um, or fitness or a combination of both. But I think that Jen Ronziti and uh, all these other Olympia athletes at that high caliber level, are a shiny example of no, <laughs> it's, it's not too late to start. So we kind of wanted to talk about all the different, like, am I to this? Am I to that? And, and jump into all those different topics and kind of combat that a little bit today. Yeah. And I think when it comes to age, it's like, at least, and this might be because I hang out with people who have like either, you know, they're our age and they have, you know, passed the 25 year old mark or they just hit 30 so or they so. just, or they just hit 35. Like those are like the majority of our friends. And like, they're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys are young. But like, once you turn 25, like it all goes downhill from there. Like that's what we've been like been told. That's the narrative, right? It's like your body just starts to break down once you turn 25, 30, 35, 40, whatever it is. Right. And it's like, like I'm hearing that and I'm like, well, you don't really, I'm like looking at these people that are saying that I'm like, well, you also like you know, just really don't take care of your body, at least from what I can see on a, on a day-to-day basis. So like, what does that, what does that look like if you do take care of your body and, and along the lines, like the pro athletes, it's like not just bodybuilding. And and I think bodybuilding is a great example because people tend to get better as their muscle maturity improves. And as they get older into the sport, if you look at, um, I was just mentioning team three DMJ, like Alberto Nunez, Eric Helms, um, Jeff Alberts, like they're all in their 30, late thirties, forties, fifties. And like, they are the, at the top of the game in natural bodybuilding. So like, (laughs) what does that tell you? And then what I've been around a lot is, um, volleyball. And so if you look at the AVP and that's the, the pro beach volleyball league, uh, a lot of the top competitors there are in their mid to late thirties. So like it, it's, I just think it's really comical when someone's like, Oh, I just turned 30. I'm so old. Like my body's like fighting me, my metabolism's broken. And like, I've lost all hope because <laughs> I mean, really, what, what I see that as is a mindset that's defeating themselves, not the actual physical capacity. And like, are you going to have aches and pains? Yes. Are they going to be more than when you were 18? Absolutely. 
but does that mean that like you're officially like too old to do anything for your health? Absolutely not. You should uh, take core flex. <laughs> oh, Christy, 20% off. <laughs> I've been taking that since I was like 20 years old because my knees are just destroyed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, I mean, there are so many different ways that you can kind of combat growing older in a, in a sense when it comes to lifting and bodybuilding. But I think the other thing is a lot of people and, and while you and I aren't too old, yeah, there are a lot of instances where we can look back and say, there's so much more that I know now than I did when I first started that makes me a better athlete or just overall makes me smarter when I'm in the gym. So I think that when you're older, typically you're a little bit more wiser. And so, and I think that there's more research and there's more things that have come to light. And so you have more information readily available that will make your fitness journey a little bit easier than if you had started 10, 15 years ago. Right. I could also take the flip side of that too, though, with age comes kind of doing life in a way that you have done life for a while. So like a lot of times uh, when I've worked with, you know, uh, women in their fifties and their sixties, they are the most grat- probably the most gratifying population to work with, um, in terms of just me feeling fulfilled as a coach, really seeing these people change, but the barriers to, to overcoming change are a lot higher in those people because it's like, well, I've done this, this way for 30 years, Marissa, who are you to tell me, you know, what to do differently. Right. And then, and then it's like kind of, figuring out how do we overcome these barriers to change? How do we make small habit tweaks in a way that, you know, doesn't completely disrupt this person's perception of their reality and what their life is like. And it can be, it can be very, very difficult to change habits that have been settled in for that long. Um, so it's kind of like, you got to take it from both lenses and some people will take that to the extreme of, well, I've been doing this for 30 years. There's no possible way that I can change. And they've made up in their mind that they can't change, uh, which is not the case. You can always make a change. It's always possible. Is it going to be a little bit more difficult to undo bad habits? Probably but that doesn't mean that it's not doable. And I've seen it happen time and time again. Yeah. That's a really good point, especially because I think that most people in the, in their situation with whatever habits they have instilled, it's kind of like, well, I'm not at my absolute worst and this has been sort of working for me. And so if I just stick with this like course of action, I'll just kind of maintain this way. And if I change one thing, like it could be worse and it could do this. And so I think that they get kind of stuck in that mindset of fearing change, but it's, it's, that's why you mentioned it is extremely gratifying to have someone who they start to implement very small habits, very small changes and see what can happen over time and then be a little bit more open to additional changes in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think just kind of around this conversation around starting, like starting whatever it is, no matter if you're too old, too young, too what we're going to go into all those things. But I think our a practical takeaway that you'll you'll get from this and a theme amongst everything that we're going to talk about today is really just like making sure that the changes that you're making to start again are gradual are slow. Um, I, I can't tell you the, the look of relief on a client's face when we, they sign up for the program, they're super excited, they're ready to change, but you know, you can tell like they're incredibly nervous for how much they're about to be asked to do. So then when we get on this first call and I'm like, I want you to drink water and eat protein twice a day. <laughs> and like, and they're just like, and what that's it. And like, and then the sigh of relief, right? So it's like really start with slow changes that you feel like you can digest the feel that you feel like you can work into your life without having to like really be overly stressed about it. Um, and especially if you're older and this is something that you're trying to do, but it's a difficult shift for you to make, whether that's because of your family environment or just the habits you have built up, start with something. I always encourage people to start with something that almost feels so easy that you want to laugh at the fact that you're setting it as a goal, like start that simple as like, Oh, I could do that with my eyes closed. So I say, okay, show me that you can do it with your eyes closed. And then we can move on from there. 
Yeah. And I think that this brings up another episode, which was our bonus episode, which was the, was it the top 10 things that you can do? Um, do you remember what was episode it? Six? The New Year's? Yeah, it was the, <laughs> the, yeah, the New Year's. It was that bonus episode that we did where it was just like the 10 things that you can do right now to make a change. So rather than having this like huge New Year's resolution where I'm going to lose, you know, 50 pounds, it's like, here, here are just some top 10 things that are like healthy habits that you can implement. So maybe pick one or two from there and kind of like, yeah, I can drink more water. I can go outside and take some walks and just start there and see like, okay, once those become habits, what else can I implement? What else can I do? Because I think it's really important if you try to change too much, it can feel very overwhelming and kind of just say, well, I'm not cut out for this and to just revert back. So I think that like you said, a few things here and there, and then they'll make a huge difference. And then if you continue to add in additional smaller habits and those continue to what's the word compound over time, again, you're going to see some pretty big changes. Yeah. I I feel like if there's anything that I can leave with this, just, am I too old to start? It's like, I've seen people be in the best shape of their life at 30, 40, 50, 60, and the list goes on there. And I've, I, I haven't coached in particular, but I've seen people in their seventies and eighties in the best shape of their life. Because every time that I go to watch a bodybuilding competition, they have the 50 plus 60 plus or whatever division. And there's someone that walks out there who's like 65, 70 years old. And everybody is just cheering for them like crazy because it's like, holy crap, like that is amazing. So really it's never too late to start in terms of time. Um, and ultimately like there's, there's truly never going to be a downside to, to making some healthier habit changes. And if anything, it's going to add years to your life. One thing I I do want to add with age is just the risk of not making a change and the risk of not taking care of your health or strengthening your body. And so there's two main diseases that occur just naturally with aging. And those are sarcopenia, which is the loss of muscle mass and osteopenia, which is the loss of bone mass, which both lead to, um, you know, uh, osteoporosis on the, on the negative side of bone loss. And then, you know, just continuing to waste away at at muscle mass uh, with sarcopenia. And so those are things that we really want to prevent with aging. So when you do get into like the 50, 60 postmenopausal for women, like that sort of time frame, that's when that stuff is going to be happening. And the way to fight against that is going to be to eat adequate protein, fruits, vegetables, taking care of your body in that sense with nutrition and strengthening your body. And I think one misconception that a lot of uh, older or elderly individuals have is like, oh, you know, I'm not, I'm not cut out to put a barbell on my back, or I'm not going to be pumping dumbbells like I used to when I was 30 or whatever. And it's like, no, it's not what we're asking you to do. I think one thing that's important to distinguish about resistance training is that resistance can be anything. It's anything that provides a challenge to your body. So for I was explaining this to a client yesterday, you know, she was asking, you know, why are pushups in my program? Would it be better to do a chest press with dumbbells or, you know, can I, can I do more body weight exercises? Like, I don't really understand. And it's like, well, your chest muscles aren't as strong as your leg muscles. So if I were to give you an air squat, it's not challenging because you would need weight added like a goblet squat or a back squat to actually work your legs in a way that challenges them. But for pushups, since your chest and shoulders and triceps aren't as strong relative to your body weight, that provides a challenge, right? So for an elderly person, just getting up off off of a chair could be resistance training. Just, you know, getting up off of the floor could be resistance training standing on one leg and trying to balance could be, you know, resistance and stability training. So it doesn't have to be this crazy thing. You don't have to be at a gym. You don't have to be doing all these things. You could use your body weight. You could use a resistance band and you can use anything that provides you with a bit of a challenge to strengthen your body at that point. Yeah. And those are all really, really good points. And I think another misconception that a lot of people have when it comes to getting older is they think, well, oh, my metabolism is shot. I, you know, my metabolism is lowered. And a lot of it comes from, well, like Marissa was just saying that you have a decrease in muscle mass, especially if you've stopped resistance training and you have typically a decrease in movement. So two of those things 
or can significantly decrease your metabolism. So it's not that you get older and your metabolism decreases, it's the habits and the practices that you implement in your everyday life. So keeping in resistance training, like Marissa was saying, it doesn't have to be this crazy barbell, you know, workout five, six, seven days a week, but just something here and there and making sure you stay active can prove to be extremely beneficial for the elder population. And not only that, but you do have the mental component. I think I've talked about this before, but when you are doing some sort of resistance training, typically you do have some sort of mind muscle connection so that neural activity can be really beneficial for the benefits for your mental capacity as you get older. So um, I can't remember if I've talked about this before on a podcast, but um, on a different podcast I was listening to, uh, this guy was a personal trainer and he was working with this woman who had osteoporosis and her numbers, her bone density was really bad. And all they started doing was resistance training. It was like two or three times a week, just not, again, not anything crazy. And they did it for a couple months. She went back and got tested and her results were like completely flipped. And the doctor was just like, he, he was like blown away. He was like, what have you been doing? She's like, I've been going to the gym. And it was the improvements that she made were so significant that they ended up doing a case study on her with her numbers and everything like that. So I think it's just, it's really cool. We've talked about this, or this is a different topic that we have, which am I too diseased or, you know, do I have too many uh, medical issues to start training? So I don't know if we want to jump into this (laughs) or another one. Um, But sometimes when you have some sort of diagnosis, and of course you want to talk with your doctor, you don't want to do anything too crazy without letting them know, but oftentimes you can supplement with improving your fitness and improving your health. And you might be amazed at what changes you can make instead of just taking a pill and waiting around and seeing what happens. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we can just jump into, okay, am I too diseased? Am I, do I have too many diagnoses to start? Um, you know, and there's a lot of, a lot of ground we can cover here. And the first thing that I want to say is we are not giving medical advice. Talk to your practitioner first, please. But these are things that uh, we've just seen in practice. So like, for example, a lot of people that come to us for nutrition coaching and fitness coaching are overweight or obese. And, you know, that is a disease that is directly curable by, by diet and exercise. And there are, you know, medications like blood pressure medications and those sorts of things that a lot of our clients, um, or I don't want to speak for you, but clients that I've worked with have been taking, uh, and when we get into the nitty gritty of like, okay, we're being consistent with diet, we're being consistent with exercise. And like, maybe the weight comes off, maybe it doesn't, but then the next doctor's visit, it's, oh, shoot, you don't need these blood pressure medications anymore because everything in your body is regulating much better. And so a lot of these things can kind of be, these meds can be weaned off of once a healthy lifestyle is established. Again, not taking, don't take that as medical advice of like, oh, you're, you're lifting now. So you can just stop taking these things, make sure you clear it with your doctors first. But, um, that, that is something that you can directly see. Same thing with, um, diabetes, for example, if you have type two diabetes, uh, if you lift weights and you keep better track of your diet, a lot of times blood sugar issues will start to re-regulate resistance training is super, super beneficial for improving insulin sensitivity. So that's something that can help with diabetes, building muscle, losing body fat, getting your, your body in a better place. Um, and then there's also like, for example, cancer, which is a really you know, sad and and awful disease. I personally know at least one cancer survivor who she was going to the gym through, through it all. She had thyroid cancer and she is freaking amazing. And I, I'm sure she doesn't speak for everybody and every cancer patient, but she was going to the gym throughout treatment, throughout everything. And, uh, it was basically her escape and her, her safe place from all of the stress and trauma and everything that having cancer can bring upon you. Um, and, and I'm sure she might be actually listening to this episode. So, um, you know, if you're listening to this, like it's freaking inspiring. And it just goes to show that really living a healthier lifestyle can help you to overcome these things. And did the resistance training or eating healthy cure her cancer? We will never be able to say, we don't know, but could it have been a net positive? 
maybe. And is it a net negative? I would say arguably probably not. Yeah. And, and something that you just made me think of is she talked about how it was kind of like her escape. And so resistance training and bodybuilding and going to the gym, working out and whatever that looks like for you, maybe there, you know, of course there are the, the physical benefits and the health benefits from working out, but there are so many mental benefits that come from it as well that a lot of people don't necessarily see or think of because it's not as, as I don't know, popular maybe, because I think a lot of times is when you see someone working out, you see their physical changes that they make and you don't see the mental ones. But Marissa and I have talked about this so much and which is one of the reasons we love bodybuilding. We love competing so much is because of the confidence that we've gained, the ability to feel like we can do anything we put our minds to. And that's, those are two things I didn't have (laughs) when I was in high school and developed a little bit more in college, but there, you know, if you are have uh, something like cancer that you're going through this experience, and if you just sit on your couch and don't do anything about it, then that can be detrimental towards your, like your mental space, your mental health and how you view things and your outlook. So something positive, like going to the gym and, and sticking to something, having that dedication. Yeah. Maybe it doesn't like quote unquote cure cancer, but it helps just be in a, in a better mental spot to deal with everything you have going on in your life. Right. And the main thing with training or even just sticking to a healthy lifestyle with your diet or habits is what it teaches you is, can you follow through on a commitment you made to yourself? And this is often one of the main things that hold people back from starting a healthy lifestyle in the first place is they're worried that they are going to fail themselves again. They're worried that they're going to, you know, start something and then not be able to follow through on it and be disappointed in themselves. And, you know, if we can, if we can say anything is again, set, set a goal that you could honestly laugh at and start building momentum, building positive momentum from there, because if you can be consistent and you can learn how to integrate this into your lifestyle, no matter what point you're starting at, having the confidence of being able to say, I follow through on the things that I say that I'm going to do is invaluable. And it will carry into every other aspect of your life. The reason why Christina and I you know, have been pursuing and have not given up, given up on building our own businesses is part of what probably, uh, probably in part to bodybuilding and the character traits that that builds and like the confidence and just, again, being able to follow through on your actions. So, um, yeah, there's, there's so many positives to just your mental fortitude and strength and your ability to fight through things, uh, when it comes to training, going to the gym, pushing yourself, pushing your limits. And does that mean that, you know, if you are, if you have diagnoses or you're 70 years old, that you need to, you know, you need to be an Olympic weightlifter and, and put big barbells over your head. No, just like go in there and challenge yourself. It doesn't matter what that is, or it doesn't even have to be at the gym, just at home, just challenge yourself. I feel like that was a mic drop and we could just end the episode there. <laughs> yeah, it could be, but we, we have a little bit more to go over. Yeah, we have a couple more. Um, so I think that maybe another transition or segue is, you know, am I, am I too injured? Like, do I have all of these things? And I feel like that kind of goes hand in hand kind of with being like, am I too diseased or have too much going on medically? So I know that we just plugged this episode, but if you listen to episode seven, which is with Nick Licamelli, which is one of, I think probably one of my most referenced episodes with current clients is, you know, if you have something going on, which impedes your normal resistance training, your normal workouts, you know, does that mean that you need to stop completely um, or that you can't start or do you just have to wait until you're healed? So I would highly recommend taking a listen to that one if that, if this relates to you or if if, uh, you feel like that might be you, but there are a lot of different workarounds and there are a lot of different ways that you can modify workouts and a lot of things that you can do to kind of, again, work around your injury or whatever you have going on. Um, And I feel like Marissa is a very good person to speak on this topic. Yeah. Yeah. So am I too injured to start? I think, so first of all, the beauty of 
kind of just wanting to get stronger, live a healthier lifestyle. And, you know, you don't have specific goals, say to power lift or, you know, weight lift or anything like that. You don't have to do any particular movement. You don't have to put a bar on your back. You don't have to do a deadlift. Like there's a lot of, and this comes into kind of talking about age too. Like if you're 50, 60 years old, you've done this before you've been in the gym, you've been out of the gym. There's probably narratives around exercises or movements or workouts that, you know, you might have biases to or against, right? So a lot of people tend to fall victim to the narrative that squatting or deadlifting is bad for you and your back um, and those sorts of things. So it's like, okay, is that what's preventing you from getting into the gym is like, I've had these conversations before with people's parents and like with, with, with new clients and it's like, well, I don't want to go to the gym because, you know, squatting is bad for your back. Okay. Well, like you do realize there's about like 2000 other exercises we could do that aren't squats, right? (laughs) Like they could help you towards your fitness goals. And so I think it's, it's just kind of like a heuristic that people rely on almost as a, a, a reason that they can't start or something like that, or a bad experience. Um, I was actually listening to, uh, that episode of the three, three DMJ podcast, where I said, Nick made a really bad dad joke. It's actually a really great episode. Uh, it's called all about back pain. And of course, as soon as I saw that title, I was like, click, 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 let's listen. Right. <laughs> and one thing that Eric Helms said on that episode that I really, really liked was, um, he had hip surgery. Uh, and when he was in recovery from that surgery, his doctor said, okay, don't go into the gym. And that's very, very common for surgery or for injuries, or just like your general practitioner. If you go to them with some kind of a pain, if they're not well-versed in strength and conditioning and like newsflash, not a lot of general practitioners are, um, they're going to say like, oh, just stay out of the gym until it feels better. And like, that is the that is the best advice for most people that covers like a, a large ground, right? Cause they're a general practitioner. They're not a specialist. So if you go to them and you are a specialty client of like, okay, you are trying to live this healthy lifestyle. You're doing what 99% of people don't. And you're trying to take care of your body and, and exercise regularly. And they say, stay out of the gym until you feel better. Following that is probably going to be pretty demotivating. Right. And so what Eric, did is he basically had his hip surgery and they said, stay out of the gym, um, until it's better. And he said, listen, you know, I got a, I have a PhD in strength and conditioning and, you know, maybe we can collaborate a little bit here. I know I, I probably can't squat. Can I hip thrust because of like this movement pattern? And like, just, he described it and all that. And his doctors were like, they, his doctors walked away from that conversation being like, yeah, you can definitely hip thrust. And like, I never really considered it that way. So now they had this new <laughs> breadth of knowledge of like this p- specific population. And, and it's not necessarily just the gym. It's, it's these movements. It's these exercises that are going to aggravate or Im- impede the recovery. So a lot of times, like, Uh, And this is going to vary with our audience, depending on how well versed you are and how much you know or don't know. But this is where kind of having a a personal trainer or someone who's who's well versed in exercise can help you is like a lot of times I will I've done this before. And I, I have one client in mind who I'm thinking of. He had some back issues. He went to his GP. And they were like, just don't do anything for three weeks. And I I pushed him and I was like, can you just ask, like, can you do seated dumbbell bicep curls? (laughs) <laughs> can you do a seated, a seated tricep kickback? Like, can you do yeah. something that's like literally your torso's not moving and like, we're just doing curls. Right. And so I pushed him to ask those questions because it's like, is it the gym? Is it working out? Or is it like these, these things, right? I Specific think it, exercises to avoid. Yeah. So I feel like there, there's always something that you can do if you have an injury, it's just a matter of figuring out what that is. Yeah. And I think Nick made some really good points in that episode as well. Cause he's like, okay, with your injury, like, again, what is the outcome that you want? And again, if you have a, you know, Marissa saying that, oh, you don't need to squat, you don't need to deadlift, but if you are a power lifter, then of course that's, that's going to change a little bit. But if you're just that general gym goer who wants to stay healthy and lift, then yeah, maybe you can avoid those exercises and still be hundred percent fine. So 
it's, it's trying to figure out like, can I modify certain exercises? Can I do things a little bit differently? Is it only when I lift heavy? Is it only when I'm in this certain rep range? So do I need to avoid those things? So sometimes we're, we're very quick and it makes sense because I'm, I'm the same way too. Like if I start to get some sort of pain, I'm like, Ooh, I need to stop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's our immediate reaction is whatever I'm doing. I need to stop. So he kind of says, well, let's kind of explore that pain a little bit, depending on how severe that pain is. <laughs> so it's like, can I lower the weight? Does that help the pain? Does the pain go away? Can I increase the rep range? Can I decrease the rep range? Like what can I do to kind of avoid that pain, but still continue with this movement pattern? So I think that's something too, to think about. Um, but when you were talking about Eric, I think that is, that's really funny. I'm trying to imagine being that doctor telling Eric Helms to not work out. I know. <laughs> right. um, yeah. But I think that is really good to advocate for yourself. And I'm glad that he said something instead of just kind of saying, well, I'm just going to do whatever on my own. And that kind of makes me feel like when I go and see my doctors, and I've talked about this before, they're like, don't lift more than 25 pounds. And I'm like, okay, I get that this is this blanket statement that you, that you're giving to all pregnant women. And I could see how someone who's never lifted anything before in their entire life, avoiding anything over 25 pounds would be some really good, helpful, like thing to avoid. But for me, when I have been lifting and been doing it for many, many years, 25 pounds is nothing. I'm like, so I can't even squat a bar. Like I can't even deadlift a bar. Um, so I feel like that just doesn't, it's just not the same. And so I, every single time they've said something, I'm like, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I've just tried to avoid like the confrontation or like the, the, the fight that might ensue. So instead I, I feel like I'm more inclined to say something the next time, or if I do get that, uh, advice again. Um, so I think that that's, that's good. Cause maybe they might change their perspective or their outlook or how they help additional pregnant women. Yeah, absolutely. And I think like, especially with the pre and postnatal stuff that both you and I have learned through the certification that we did and like, just in general, like this whole conversation around talking with your medical team about these things surrounding your health and fitness journey, because there's just so much shit information in the industry that like makes these things come about. It's like, okay, like, of course we don't want someone, uh, one rep max squatting while they're nine months pregnant, uh, because that probably is going to put a lot of undue stress on things and probably not be the best decision. Right. And so it's like, we take, it's like people see these viral videos on Instagram, or they see like the worst possible case scenario. And then that turns into the blanket statement of like, okay, well then we just, we can't do this at all. Right. Or like don't lift over 25 pounds. And it's like, okay, well, what about like your crock pot that probably weighs like however much like full of food, right? You're lifting that around when you're cooking. Um, what about like, you know, all of these groceries that you're taking from the car into the house in one trip? It's like, those probably weigh more than 25 pounds. So it's like these things that people are doing in, in re regular life that it's like this blanket statement is kind of like, it's almost laughable when you think about it that way. So yeah, when it comes to like, just asking your medical practitioners, these questions, um, I mean, not, I can't speak for every medical practitioner, but typically their best interest is to help you and to get you from, you know, point A to point B or to help you through a journey and to do so in the way that, that is best possible for both parties. And so if you kind of frame it from that perspective of like, okay, we're not coming at each other. We're not looking to disagree, but like really just, you know, can I ask you a question? Like, uh, you know, so I've been doing this for seven years. I like, I'm pretty strong for my weight. I typically do this, this, and this, like you're, you're, you know, you're asking me to not lift thing, anything over 25 pounds. I totally get that. That's like a good guideline for a lot of people, but you know, I'm just curious what specifically shouldn't I be doing? And like, where is kind of the wiggle room in that? Because like, I've been, you know, I think I'm a different population than who you're normally talking to. Right. And the other thing too, is we'll go a lot more in depth into this topic. Yeah. To our, our pregnant ladies, <laughs> we have a, a podcast episode dedicated specifically to lifting heavy while pregnant. So we will definitely go way, way more in depth. But I think the big takeaway is, yeah, absolutely. Whatever it is that you're dealing with, 
you get this blanket statement from a medical professional. And instead of taking it for their exact word and, and, and verbatim, talk to them, see if there is some wiggle room and see if there's anything. And again, it's, it's not to say that, um, like who, shoot, there was another episode I was listening to. Um, this woman had a particular instance where she couldn't, she was told that she couldn't eat a lot of protein. And I forget what specifically, I think she had issues with her liver. And this is something that we hear again, like, oh, if you eat too much protein, you're going to develop liver issues, but she actually had something wrong with it. And so they said that she could only eat, I think it was like 70 grams of protein. And she asked like, Hey, can I supplement with collagen? And they were like, absolutely not. She was like, okay, <laughs> but, you know, but she asked. And so she got her answer and they had very specific reasons why she couldn't do that. And so, but she asked, you know, she didn't just do it on her own. And I think the other thing they said is she was like, can I do this? If you continuously check my uh, liver enzymes and if you check all of these numbers and we're constantly doing blood, blood work. And they were like, it, you may not see a change uh, acutely, but over time you will see a change in your numbers. And so they're like, we don't want to risk elevating them even more. Um, so we're not going to do that. And she's like, okay. And so she had an, a very specific answer to why she could not do that. Um, right. So I think it's, it's really important that like, yes, your, your doctors want to help you. They're not trying to make your life miserable. Um, and they are trying to give these statements because they don't want to say anything that could potentially make anything worse. Um, but still trying to have a conversation, kind of meet them in the middle and see if there's anything that you can do. Right. And I think what I got from that, that I really liked is just ask the questions so that they have to think about it because how many people does a doctor see a day? I don't know a lot. Right. So it's like, okay, you know, the pre prenatal care might be saying, don't lift anything over 25 pounds, like over and over and over again, or, you know, the, the doctor with the, the high protein intake might be saying that over and over and over again, depending on their specialty and the types of people that they see. So like that answer again, is going to work for 99% of people, maybe, maybe 95, I don't know, but like make them think about it. So like, for example, Eric Helms, like, Hey, you said, don't go into the gym. Is it, is it the gym or is it, you know, and the doctor has to think about, it and they're like, well, no, it's really just like these movements that like, you probably shouldn't be doing, but it's not something I ever really considered because all I've been saying is this blanket statement. So we force the doctor to think about it and then give him a more specific answer. So like you were saying, get a specific answer, get a reason, right. And then that then the doctor also walks away with from that conversation now having thought through like why am I giving this recommendation you know who might not it be for like all of those little nuances um, and then you're able to walk away with hopefully more than you got originally and you know you're able to continue carrying on as best possible right so yeah, uh, yeah I think just make making them think about it um, again with with politeness and you know asking questions in an innocent and curious way rather than coming at someone. But yeah, I think that's super, super helpful. Yeah. So the next topic we have is, am I too weak? Am I too weak to start my fitness journey? So absolutely not. Everyone starts somewhere. And again, that's a very cliche answer, but you know, that not to compare your chapter two to someone else's chapter 30. So if you go into the gym and you see all these people who are lifting all of this weight and it's easy to feel intimidated and believe it or not, you know, Marissa and I started there too. And even that person who you're intimidated with, they had to start somewhere as well. And so I think something that we were talking about off air was, have we ever done a podcast all around gym confidence and how to combat that? And I do think that that's something that's super important that we can touch on way more in depth. But when it comes to the am I too weak? I think that the people who are at the gym, typically that you are most maybe scared of, <laughs> they're usually the ones that are going to be the most helpful. And the ones that if you ask them, Hey, how do I do this machine? Or, Hey, you uh, are deadlifting 500 pounds. Like, how do you do that? How did you get there? They are going to be the ones that are going to be the most vested to like help you and give you advice and to you know, check your form. And of course there are, yeah, there are those douchebags <laughs> that you don't want to talk to and want to avoid. Um, typically you can pick those people out. They're like loud, they're grunting, they're very like macho, uh, whatever men or women. But typically a lot of people who are in the gym are just happy that you're there. And a lot of times people are so concerned 
with their own workouts and how they're doing and how they look that they don't really care. And they're not looking around going, oh, they're only using five pound dumbbells. Like, oh, they should be here. <laughs> like no one really thinks that way. So I think that it is very easy to be self-conscious when you go into the gym, but the more you do it, the more confidence you're going to get. And the more kind of like, okay, I can do this. And it, it's not a big deal. I'm not going to get laughed out of the gym. And it just makes it a lot easier to keep coming back. And of course, you know, what's super cool. If you are new to resistance training, you are going to get newbie gains and it is so much fun <laughs> because you will progress very, very rapidly uh, in a short amount of time. So it, it's not going to be like that forever, um, <laughs> but just embrace it while you can, because it is super cool and it's very motivating. Um, and it gives you that kind of like, okay, well, I'm progressing. So I'm going to continue to go back and see what else I can do, but you're never too weak. Everyone starts somewhere and it's best to just get in there and start. Yeah, totally. I was going to say on like the, the gym douchebags note, um, typically those are going to be the people that like are curling in the squat rack. And like, it's going to be the people that like almost know what they're doing, but like, you can kind of pick out that like something's not right there. So like, again, it's like the, the overly, like almost overly compensating for being, you know, wanting to lift heavy or like, you know, their form is just trash because they're just ego lifting. Those are going to be going to be the people that are probably going to be pretty rude because they have a lot of insecurities that are built up. So yeah, definitely avoid those folks, but yeah, the ones that are kind of like quietly doing their thing, but like kind of humble, but like are unnaturally strong or like, <laughs> you know, just like, oh, wow, shoot, you are so nonchalant about the fact that you're lifting that much or you are, you know, so consistent or whatever, or you look that way. People that are nonchalant about that are usually like super friendly when you like tap them on the shoulder and ask them something. So they may not look friendly at first, yeah, I know. <laughs> but it's because they're in their zone and they're not focused and they're not looking around and they're not looking at anyone else. So yeah. yeah, they may look very unapproachable, but once you start talking to them, like they're, they're so nice. And I am so thankful for the people that I've been confident enough to approach in the gym and talk to. And like, you almost start to get like these gym buddies and they'll come over and ask, you know, how you're doing or they're just kind of check in. And, but they're most of the time, they're not going to take that initiative first because they like, they don't want to approach everyone. And I feel like this sometimes myself, like if someone's doing something wrong, I'm just like, okay, just don't, don't say anything, just do your own thing. But if someone were to come up and be like, Hey, am I doing this right? Is my form right? Yeah. I would take all the time in the world to help them out. So usually they're looking for other people to take initiative because they're not looking for, to be that person at the gym, helping everyone in the room. So don't be afraid to take initiative. Right. Right. It's a fine balance. Cause it's like, yes. you know, those types of people are there to kind of get in and get out, but at the same time, they are also super nice and friendly. And like, if you truly are lost or confused or just nervous, like just confiding in someone like that can be super helpful. Yeah. Um, I would also helps. say, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I was going to say having a coach or a trainer can be really beneficial as well, because you have someone who you're like, Hey, like I went in the gym and I did this, or here's my form. Let me send you a video on this. And you have someone who's advocating for you and saying, Hey, you're doing great. Like, and so sometimes just that small little like boost of like, you can do it. <laughs> it. It makes it a little bit easier to keep going back into the gym. And you know that you have someone who has your back and can kind of give you some momentum going forward and can improve your workouts week to week. And so you are going to make improvements, but it's really helpful to have people like that in your corner. So another thing that helps too, and again, we'll do a whole episode on this, but having a gym buddy. So having someone that you can go in and kind of gauge like your strength with, or maybe even push you a little bit more. And this is something I definitely experience with women. We, for some reason, we find it difficult sometimes to, to like push ourselves when it comes to the weights that sometimes we're scared. Um, we doubt our abilities. And for some reason, when I was like this, when I first started lifting with my husband, who was boyfriend at the time, I was really weird about like showing that I was trying. I don't know how to like really explain it, but I didn't want to like be pushing these 25 pounds for a chest press and like, I don't know, be struggling really hard to do it because I'm like, oh my God, it's only 20 pounds. <laughs> um, 
So I, I found that I was able to push myself a lot more when I was by myself or when I was with a friend as opposed to certain people. So I don't know, maybe think about what your mentality is when you go into the gym or really check yourself. Um, but I was able to really push past what I thought I was able to do when I lift, when I had a different mindset around lifting. I don't really know if I explained that very well, but that is something that I experienced. <laughs> yeah. It almost sounds like it's a certain level of comfort with who you're around. So it's yeah. like, if you're comfortable with someone to like show that you're struggling and you know, the, the showing that you're struggling thing, it almost like points to the, am I too weak to start? It's like, you don't want to be lifting 10 pound dumbbells and feel like it, it's a struggle because then that makes you feel or look weak to other people. Right. right and so, right. so maybe that's, kind of where that stems from. And then like, if it's people that you're around that you're not comfortable to show that you're struggling with, like that could change things. So like someone that you're super close with, like a boyfriend or a husband might be easier to have that kind of, um, honesty with versus someone who is like, Oh, I'm meeting up with this girl that I met on Instagram at the gym. Her name's Marissa Roy fitness, like that back in 2016, <laughs> but like, it's, it's like, okay. At that point, it's like, we're both doing this thing. So we're like, maybe we're feeling each other out and seeing like, oh, who's stronger? Who's trying harder? Like that might be a more situation where it's like kind of holding back in a way. I don't know, just kind of rambling on that. But yeah, the one thing I wanted to say on, am I too weak to start is, is what's the alternative? (laughs) Because if you don't start, you're going to stay weak. And then that's going to impact a lot of other areas of your life. And uh, like the alternative is what you try to do it on your own at home. Like I I don't know. There's just like, there's not really another option to get stronger. Um, you have to put yourself through challenges and, you know, if you, if you want to start from home with push-ups, squats, sit-ups, like it's a great place to start. Um, but ultimately at some point that's going to be, that's going to be the ceiling. It's going to be capped. You're going to be, you know, too strong for that. And so then it's time to step into the gym and, and even then you might still feel like, well, I'm too weak to start there. But again, there's no alternative. (laughs) Yeah. And I think that kind of, as we, as we're talking about, like, am I too weak and talking about feeling self-conscious when you're in the gym. So I think that kind of goes hand in hand with like, am I too fat? So people who feel like it's very difficult to step into a gym setting, because again, they're going to, they're fearing that someone is going to think differently of them, or, you know, maybe laugh them out of the gym whatever, whatever insecurities that you have around how you look again, it's, it's, what's the alternative and you have to start somewhere and maybe you can do some things at home and improve some things, but eventually going into the gym. And again, a lot of times people are not judging you for how you look. If anything, again, most people, not all, but most people are going to be happy for you to see you there. And if anything might cheer you on and might help and might come up and talk to you and give you advice because they're, they're happy to see you there and they want you to be successful. A lot of people at the gym, again, <laughs> there are those, those douchebags, those ego lifters who want to feel like they are the best at the gym. Um, but a lot of times the majority of them who are the regulars who are there all the time, they're going to be cheering you on. So there's no such thing as, is too fat, too weak, too this, too that people want you there and they want to see you succeed. Yeah. Yeah. I think with the, like, am I too fat to start? Um, one thing I've heard a lot is, you know, when it comes to the coaching thing, it's like, okay, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm going to lose some weight first and then I'll start or it's, I'm going to lose some weight first and then I'll resistance train. Right. And it's like, I'm going to do cardio first and then I'll, then I'll lift weights. Right. Because I need to lose weight first before I do that. And it's, it's kind of a backwards train of thought, uh, because ultimately it's starting. That's the hardest for most people. It's building that initial momentum. That's the hardest for most people. So it's like saying that you're going to do that alone and then do like the easy part when you have someone support, like (laughs) it's, it's kind of backwards. Right. And I, I definitely hear where it's coming from because it's, it's the insecurity of like, well, I'm, I'm not like, the other clients that these people work with. I'm not like the, the other people that go to the gym. So I I need to be more like them before I step into that environment. But, um, that's, I mean, like you said, it's, it's not, it's not a judgment game. It's not, it's not, you need to fit in to be here. It's, you know, you, you just got to start there. Like 
there is no better alternative. There are, there obviously are alternatives. You could try just dieting first. You could try just doing cardio first, but I mean, the, the physical benefits, mental benefits that you're going to get from just starting with the gym at the beginning and starting with support at the beginning is going to be so much better for you. Uh, one thing that like, if, if I can add on to the physical benefit of starting with lifting weights first, um, instead of like trying to lose weight with just cardio or just diet or some combination of that first is the difference between weight loss and fat loss. So weight loss is the number on the scale is going down. You weigh physically less, uh, but fat loss is losing body fat. And so resistance training and lifting is going to accelerate fat loss and prevent it from being just weight loss, right? Cause you don't want to lose your muscle mass. What's that, what is that going to do for you down the road? It's going to make it harder for you to keep losing body fat. So if you start out just by doing cardio and under eating, you're going to lose not only fat, but muscle, and it's going to make it harder for you to start resistance training. When you do decide that you're ready, because you're going to be weaker. You're going to have less muscle to work with. Um, and it's going to make it harder for you to keep losing body fat because you have less muscle, AKA less metabolism to work with, uh, and, and really move that fat loss along. So it does make your journey harder down the road to not start with lifting and nutrition, um, as well as, you know, if you need to use cardio as well, use cardio, but really just the foundations of strength training and proper nutrition habits is going to be the number one thing that'll actually kick off your weight loss journey to be better, uh, rather than, you know, feeling like you need to wait to start. Yeah. And, and like we've said many, many times throughout the episode is that there's no real downside to just eating better and lifting weights or doing some sort of resistance training that there are only going to be more, more often than not, there are only going to be positives that stem from that. So whatever it is that you're going through, if you are, if you have a, a diagnosis, if you're injured, if you feel like you're too fat, too weak, too old, too young, whatever it is that you're going through, if you implement healthy eating habits and some sort of resistance training, and it doesn't have to be anything too extreme, just some small tweaks here and there can make a huge difference overall, whether that is to your physical appearance, whether it's for your mental health or both just do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love it. Um, our last one is just, am I too young to start? And so, you know, lifting when you're, you know, 10 years old, 13 years old, 15 years old, whatever age, I think the main thing that this comes from is just like high school weight rooms and, uh, the myth that like lifting heavy and back squatting as a, as a kid will stunt your growth, right. Or it'll, you know, bust your discs or, or whatever it is. Um, so at this point, that is a myth that has been proven to be false. It doesn't stunt growth. Um, and really it's just a matter of, okay, are we teaching these children, these kids how to lift safely? And so really when it, what it comes down to with this question is no one's too young to start. Like you have, you see these viral videos of like little toddlers playing with like toy barbells. It's adorable. Right. And they but, have good form. Too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, it's really, are we teaching these kids how to do it safely? And what it's actually going to do is improve their motor control for uh, sports moving forward for activities moving forward. Cause how often do you have kids running around and playing and one of them trips and falls? And, you know, those are the types of injuries that you're actually preventing by having them go in the weight room and, and develop those neuromuscular connections earlier rather than later. Um, and it does, it does set kids up for success with athletics and just in general with, with healthier living. Um, so no, I, I would say you're never too young. It's just a matter of, you do need to find the appropriate guidance for those kids uh, to make sure that they are doing everything safely. Uh, anything done dangerously is probably not a good idea. <laughs> so, you know, no matter how old or young you are doing something with awful form and, and you know, ego lifting is, is not going to be in your best interest. So really, I think it's more about like the guidance and just like, what, what are we doing this lifting for at that particular age? Yeah. And I think, like you said, the movement patterns, that's, that's super beneficial. And I'm, I was thinking specifically with powerlifting because you have people that you, you take those movement patterns and maybe they're not doing, you know, one rep maxes or anything like that. And especially when you're 
toddlers <laughs> shouldn't be doing that. But when you are able to practice something and you have this movement pattern down, it's going to be so much more beneficial in the future. We're not having to uh, relearn something because you have a, a, a movement pattern that has been incorrect. Um, so that's, again, I, th I think it's super beneficial, especially with the little ones to have very specialized and individualized help rather than, again, those kind of like blanket statements. Totally. Yeah. And I think to kind of like just summarize this, this episode, there was a tweet post thing that I saw yesterday that I wanted to read. Um, just, I think it goes along a lot of the, am I too old? Am I too diseased? Uh, and it, it just really hit hard. So it said it's from Danny Matranga CSCS, who he like does a lot of like viral tweets or whatever that go around for fitness and health. But it said at some point, your health will be a priority. It will either be because you made the decision to invest in fortifying your well-being proactively or because you are faced with the ramifications of choosing not to. Either way, at some point, it will be a priority. And so, you know, am I too, is it too late? Is it, you know, am I too this? Am I too that? Really, it's like you're going to have to focus on some aspects of your health at some point unless you're really, really, really lucky. And if you, and I wouldn't even say lucky because the people that don't run into these things probably have some sort of like inherent habits that aren't bad um, already in place, right? But if, if you are going through just bad habits, fast food, sedentary lifestyle, and all these things that like are perpetuated right now, just, it, just in our population, then it is going to lead to that, right? So really just understanding that it has, they're the best day to start was yesterday, but you know, just, just getting started no matter what is always going to end up as a net positive to your life, your well being, your health and everything, um, no matter how small you decide to start. Yeah. So I think that's a, a really good note to end on. And the other thing I want to throw out is if there's something that we didn't cover, or if there's something very specific that you have going on and you want to reach out to either one of us or both of us, you can go ahead and DM us. You can DM the, uh, our actual podcast, Instagram page, whatever it is. And, and we'll take the time to kind of walk you through whatever it is that you're going through. Um, because we, we want all of our followers, all of our listeners to be successful and to be the best that they can be. So uh, we hope that you guys enjoyed this episode and it really resonated with you. And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to the podcast. You can find both of us on Instagram. You can find me at Christy Lynn Fit and Marissa is at Marissa Roy Fitness. Thank you guys so much for listening and we hope to see you back next week.